Look, uh, I have, uh, I'll ask Claude also to uh, unmute himself and, um, and put his video on so that we can all see him. Um, look, um, thanks again for joining us, as I said earlier. Hey, Claude, I can see you now. Um, Hi, Ron, good morning. But um, I appreciate that um, everyone's time is very valuable. So um, thank you very much for um, um, jumping online with us for, uh, for another one of the, in our series. Um, look, we have, um, we've been doing things like JobKeeper and Cashflow Boost to Death um, over the last few weeks. So we are going to touch on those things today, but we thought it'd be worthwhile having a quick chat on, uh, on some tax planning type issues. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so look guys, um, what I will do is I'm going to run through, most of you know the drill by now. If you can just bear with me for 30 seconds, I just need to, um, um, deal with a couple of housekeeping issues. What I will do is I'll ask Claude to just deal with those just momentarily. Claude, can I get you to just run through those? Sure thing, Kelvin. Um, yeah, so as you can see on the screen, um, or hopefully everyone can see on the screen, um, if you can everybody just keep your microphones turned off while we're presenting the webinar. Um, once we begin the presentation, um, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the um, presentation. However, if you would like to um, ask some questions during the webinar, just use the chat function um, that's available and we will get to that as part of the Q&A session as well. Um, the, chat, yeah, the chat function is, for those not aware, is at the bottom of the, um, of the screen there. Um, so yeah, so that way uh, we can keep the webinar moving nice and freely and then it can answer all the questions towards, towards the end of the uh, presentation. Great, thanks very much, Claude. Uh, and look, I do apologise, everyone. Um, if you hadn't already guessed, I am working from home, but uh, sadly, my uh, my ten week old pup has broken his leg, so he's uh, he's a little bit distressed just sitting next to me. So I just needed to um, to move him around so he's a bit more comfortable. So apologies for that. Hopefully, he uh, he is uh, a bit more comfortable now, and uh, and we can uh, move on. So as I said, apologies, but um, that won't distract us from what we're doing today. So. Um, look, what I will do is I'll run through, thank you, Claude, for running through the housekeeping. Um, very quick agenda. As we said, we've got a bit of uh, bit of JobKeeper and, um, and things like that that we're looking at today. However, we won't be going into too much detail on that. Um, we um, will also be having a look at uh, cash flow reporting, um, financing. Um, sorry, guys, Claude, I might have to hand to you again very quickly. Um, just uh, run through that. Yep, okay. Uh, so yeah, so as you can see on, on the agenda, um, we'll be going through the JobKeeper um, process again. Now we have covered this quite extensively the last few weeks, but we'll, um, we're still getting some uh, general questions about it. So we'll go through the process again, just touching it very briefly. Um, we'll talk about cash flow and why it's important coming up to um, this time of the year. Uh, none more so than, you know, the current um, uh, situation we're all going through with uh, COVID-19 and how that effect is impacting business. We'll briefly talk about some financing, which we have talked about briefly uh, previously, um, what currently the banks are doing, what you can do as a business and so forth. Um, we'll also touch on rent relief. Um, while that is still hasn't been passed um, in legislation yet, there are still some guidelines that we can follow. Um, importantly, we also talk about tax planning and how that's critical come 30 June this year. Um, we'll also um, talk about our business continuity planning for those of you uh, that are aware of it or not in that case. Um, and then we'll, like I said before, we'll go through some uh, Q&As, answer some questions that have been asked already, as well as um, try and answer any ones that um, people post in the chat function as we go along. Thanks, Claude. And, um, and yes, the Q&As have uh, become the most, uh, or the area of most interest lately because uh, there are plenty of questions that are getting asked of us. So we have a number that we will run through uh, as we have done previously. And, uh, and as we uh, have already mentioned, uh, if you do have any questions, just post them in the chat, chat uh, box and um, we'll get to those at the end unless we uh, are dealing with them on the way through. But we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions. We are hoping to skip through all of this pretty quickly today. Um, which either lets everyone off the hook pretty early or uh, it does allow us plenty of time for, um, 
for questions at the end. So thanks very much. So um, look, let me just jump forward. Um, JobKeeper, again, we're not going to do this to death. Um, we're really just going to go over the top. So as we all know now, I think, um, JobKeeper is about uh, employers being able to pay their eligible employees $1,500 a fortnight. Um, there's certain criteria in all of this, and that's where all of the eligibility comes in. Um, you are reimbursed in arrears. So, for example, for the month of May, as we're currently in, if you are paying your um, eligible, um, uh, you're paying your eligible employees that $1,500 a fortnight, then um, uh, you will be reimbursed. However, for the month of May, as that comes through, you won't get it until June. So, um, <laughs> apologies, guys. Um, Claude, I'll get you to run through this, please, if you don't mind. Yep, sure thing. Uh, looks like you got your hands there full, Kelvin. I have, sorry. <laughs> moment, so, um, so, yeah, so again, uh, like I've said before, this is... Uh, it seems like we're repeating ourselves a lot, but um, it's still a lot of questions being asked by everybody. Um, so it's, yeah, so once you qualify, um, it enables eligible employees, sorry, eligible employers to pay their eligible employees a minimum of $1,500 uh, pre-tax per fortnight. So um, this is uh, payments done in, um, in arrears. Um, so what the process is, once you, um, see if you've qualified. You then apply for the um, the JobKeeper um, stimulus package, and then every month, and that's the critical part. Every month is where you need to um, report to the ATO, um, and that triggers the repayment um, to come back based on your previous month's um, payment of wages to all your eligible employees. So that's the critical step that um, a few people seem to be missing uh, those of you that are doing it um, on your own um, so yeah and it's not just a one monthly uh, report it's got to be done every month right through to the end of the job keeper which is at this stage till September thanks Claude what we are also seeing as well is that um, even in the last uh, two hours we've been notified by the ATO that um, that there's certain deadlines that have been changed in relation to lodgement of monthly reporting Claude that's correct isn't it yes they've um, it's originally the reports need to be done by the 7th of every month. Um, but yeah, like you said, Kelvin, a couple of hours ago, we got an email where it says um, they've extended that to the 14th of every month. So that gives everybody um, a further week to lodge their monthly reports. A little bit of breathing space is always handy for us, uh, particularly, I mean, when you're doing your own, it, uh, it certainly helps. But when we're doing uh, uh, tens or dozens of these things uh, at the end of each month, it certainly makes life a little bit easier. So I know for us accountants and bookkeepers out there, it's uh, we're very grateful that the ATO have uh, helped out in that regard. Um, and look, sorry, I, I did flick forward to the next screen. Uh, as we all know, the 30% is the magical figure that you need a downturn in, um, in turnover for any particular month, excuse me, or period. Uh, and I refer to period being, um, you know, a quarter. But uh, as we've spoken about previously, um, the ATO allow you to either base it on factual or actual results as in the month of March or April compared to March or April last year. Um, or you do have the ability to forecast going forward. And as long as you have a, a robust way of, um, of forecasting that, um, the ATO shouldn't have huge issues as long as you have an argument as to how you forecast it. And hopefully you, you either achieve that or, um, or you meet that decline or um, you have a very good argument as to how you got there. So. Um, and critically, as we've said before, you um, you only have to pass that once, okay? So um, once you pass that decline test the first time, you are fully qualified for the duration as long as you keep paying employees. So, so keep that in mind as well. You just need to tick the box once and uh, you move forward and there's some serious dollars involved. So um, I will keep moving forward. Um, JobKeeper process, uh, as we've said previously, you do need to enrol um, for JobKeeper, and then there are specific steps that you need to go through as well. So again, 30% decline in turnover. Um, step two is you do need to nominate your employee. So um, we keep um, reinforcing this. It's not just a one-step process. You need to enrol, 
You need to nominate employees as well. They need to be eligible employees and they must consent to being nominated. Uh, as we said previously, the nomination form is a bit like a tax file number declaration that you don't send to the ATO, you must maintain it on your own files. And um, I don't think we've had too many issues in this regard, Claude, have we, where employees have not returned them or refused? No, no, not at all. So, so all the ones that we've um, managed to do on behalf of our clients or that we've been engaged to do, um, yeah, um, all the forms have come back willingly. So there's no dramas. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, there's no requirements to lodge those forms or send them to the ATO. Um, it's just to keep on file with your um, employee records. Um, yeah, who knows? There may be a time when you are required to um, show that form to the ATO, but at this stage, it's just for internal purposes. Yeah. As always, we will um, be sharing this uh, the PowerPoint with everyone on the call. Um, and you just will have seen where I hovered over that nomination notice. There's a link to the um, ATO website where you can download that, if you haven't already, I believe. Most people on the call have already um, passed through this, pro this step in the process, but uh, if you haven't, let us know. Um, this is um, uh, in relation to nominating an eligible business participant. Uh, very important also for those people who are sole traders, operate through trusts. Pretty much if you're not an employee of your business, um, but you're a director or a shareholder or a trustee or a sole trader or a partner, you're entitled to, um, to receive JobKeeper as well, as long as you meet the other tests. Uh, again, we have the form uh, and the link to the ATO website. So keep that in mind. This has been critical for a lot of our clients where the focus has really been on maintaining employees, but this helps you actually maintain your business and, and allow you to draw some funds out in due course. Um, you do need to identify and maintain these employees as well, as Claude mentioned. And the final part, step four, this is what we referred to earlier, uh, up until a short, very short time ago, as in this morning, you had until the 7th of the, the following month to lodge the monthly declaration. Um, but as we identified, the ATO have just come out and said to us, you've now got until the 14th. The, the sting in the tail of that is that if you wait those 14 days, the longer you wait to report, the longer it takes to get your money back. So uh, we have seen for the first month, so for the month of April, where we lodge forms, and in our case, we lodge forms by the, I think it was Monday the 4th of May, Claude, was that correct? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. First one. And yep. we were seeing payments come through by the 7th. So the ATO not and not delaying in this. So we encourage everyone to do your monthly reporting ASAP, get it in the door or lodged in the system so that you can get the money into your bank account. And, uh, and it's certainly a big help for some of our clients. We've seen some significant dollars come through. So um, it really is worth, you know, making this a priority at the end of the month, even right ahead of your, you know, lodgement of bass and all these sorts of things. So please keep it in mind. Um, as we said earlier, um, this the monthly declaration is not a retest. Okay, so they're not testing you or seeing whether you qualify in relation to your turnover. But what they do need to know is what your um, you know your number of employees, those sorts of things. They will ask for forecasts in relation to turnover as well. Um, but our understanding is that they will not utilise that to you know, slap you on the wrist in any way. They're more using it for statistical purposes to, um, to see where the businesses are recovering as a result of maintaining employees. So we're yet to see anything further come out on that, but we're hoping that uh, we see some results soon. Um, pretty much what we've run through, and this is where, you know, poor old Serena who updates all of our PowerPoints, uh, we didn't even get a chance to tell her about the last point where it says seventh of each month. But these are the steps we need to take, or all of us need to take in relation to um, ensuring you make the most of JobKeeper. So they're the six steps that we've run through previously. We've done this in detail and almost to death previously, um, but we will actually you know, answer any questions that people have. So they're the main steps, Claude. Claude Michael, you're on, online as well, I suppose. So um, those of you that have seen his face pop up, Michael, have you got any anything that you would like to add in relation to 
our work plan or the work plan you need for JobKeeper? No, look, I think, um, hello to everyone. Uh, just think, I think the main point uh, that I'm finding at the moment is just making sure that everyone is aware that where well, you're paying fortnightly, that um, you must make payments within that fortnight. So now the ATO have um, ceased on any extra time in allowing to make the $1,500 payment. It's now in the reporting period or the fortnight period. You need to make that payment. If you don't, they won't allow it. So, um, yeah, that's probably the, the, main, uh, the main focus uh, moving forward. For okay. That. All right. Thanks, Michael. Um, and as, just as a, a reminder, um, look, if, we, if you did want to go back to any of our previous um, uh, webinars where we've gone into more detail on, on JobKeeper in particular, um, they are all, all um, posted on YouTube. So um, feel free to have a look at those and, um, and come back with any questions. So hopefully that, um, that covers off on JobKeeper. Um, I'm sure we will get some questions because I know there's some listed at the end and that's where I'll be relying on Claude and Michael to help me out as well. Um, but um, um, without sort of dwelling further on it, I wanted to just move very quickly into cash flow planning. Um, and cash flow planning um, is something that, you know, we, we do a lot of for clients. And uh, at this time of year, in particular, we're looking at usually looking at forecasting for next financial year. Um, however, in the current circumstances, um, we're actually doing a lot of cash flow forecasting and planning over the next four to six months, particularly in relation to JobKeeper and um, you know the boosting cash flow stimulus payments that are coming through. A lot of people are saying, well, when am I going to get these amounts in the door? When do I get a credit uh, in relation to my um, PAYG instalments or withholding, sorry? Um, and how does it affect my cash flow? cash flow? What happens if I have to maintain my ease? When do I get the money? So we're breaking some of these down where, you know, some people uh, forecast on a quarterly basis. Um, you know, the, the majority to do it on monthly, but uh, in this situation, we're also seeing people doing it week to week. So very important, as I say there, um, you know, understanding your cash flow is just so crucial at the moment that you need to understand exactly what's going on in your business. We're actually seeing a lot of clients who are you know, they have a newfound respect for cash flow forecasting because they actually now understand what's coming in and going out of their business. So this doesn't have to involve us either, guys. This is not us, you know, just pushing this down your throat saying you need to come to us. Keep it as simple as you like. A one page cash flow forecast, even if it is done week to week, month to month over the next six months. Um, once you get into the flow of it, you'll find it's not as complex as it seems. And, you know, even if you're not, all that good on Excel or any other forecasting um, platforms, then just do it manually, do it longhand if need be, but I just, I recommend that you just do it, okay? We do have a worksheet that we quite often utilize, so I'm not gonna to link to that, we have done previously, um, but if you need assistance with any of this, please don't hesitate to, to chat to us on cash flow planning. Um, uh, financing, again, I just wanted to have a quick chat about financing. Um, usually at this time of year, most people are, are only ever looking at refinancing if facilities come to an end or um, back in the good old days, days when people used to look to refinance, pay interest in advance and use it as a tax planning tool. Um, at the moment, um, particularly under the current environment, we're finding that, uh, that there's uh, stress out there in relation to finances and so people are looking for assistance in relation to their overall financing and facilities that they've got in place. Uh, for those of you that were on the call I think it was three or four weeks ago we had our our resident expert on uh, on finance and uh, broking John Carrier. He came on and gave us a bit of advice on what he was seeing in the market, what was capable of being done and what his recommendations were as well. But um, I'm going to run through some of that as well. Um, but in the main, <coughs> excuse me, um, again, we just, we believe it's a critical time to look at all of your facilities, whether they're business or personal. Um, and you need to not only be looking at, all right, well, am I capable of being able to make repayments and um, you know, um, service these facilities? Um, but also we see it as an opportunity. If you are in a 
in a good position financially, the banks have got some exceedingly good deals out there, which I'll, I'll refer to shortly, um, that may give you an opportunity to um, take advantage of certain things out there. And Michael, you you know very well, you know, one client in particular who we know has taken advantage of this, gone and sought a $250,000 facility at you know very good rates um, to pursue a project that he's been looking at for a while now. and. Uh, and that's all come about because the banks have sort of opened the doors and allowed people to, to get finance under what I believe are easier terms, cheaper rates. The government are co-guaranteeing these, these facilities as well. So, so it is unique times. We need to look at it, you know, not only to protect yourself, but also if, if you're in a position to take advantage, um, please do so. Um, and also happy to talk to you. I know John Carai is also happy to discuss um, these issues with you but my first um, suggestion to everyone is talk to your current business bankers and see if they can help you out um, uh, you will those of you that were on the call with John um, will recall that he broke his presentation up into personal and business borrowing I'm not actually going to run through this slide by slide but what he did do is he he talked about um, the fact that the banks have got a much closer scrutiny on things and they are asking a lot of questions in relation, all right, well, where are you at? Have you been affected? How are you going to repay this? What is your intention? Are you getting JobKeeper is one of the other ones. Um, so it is worth um, just being across what, what the banks are thinking, um, you know, what they're doing, but, um, but also what they're thinking and how they want you to be able to repay. Um, and what their mindset is, okay? Um, these are some of the questions that he is seeing being asked. So, um, you know, just have a quick look at those, but they all revolve around COVID-19. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? Um, what's the impact? What dollars are you getting in the door? What dollars aren't you getting in the door? Um, so it is important that you're aware of the certain things that you will get asked if you go to your bank right now. Um, it's also interesting as to how they're treating JobKeeper, you know, and are they seeing it as, is that uh, income that you're going to be getting? Are you going to be getting it long term? What is the the requirement for you to access JobKeeper as well? Um, I'm just going to put up here very quickly. These were just a, a sampling of some of the um, of the offerings that John had experience with. Um, but if you look at that again, you look at you know 2.7 percent, 3.3 percent pretty much 3% across the board for some of these. And as John said, the lowest rates in a generation, I, I don't recall rates being this low previously, particularly for investment loans. Um, so they're almost unheard of. And that's why we say, all right, well, if you can lock some of these rates in because times are tough, um, or if you, um, you know, if you can access these and take advantage of things, uh, I mean, even with, uh, uh, with and this is definitely not financial advice that I'm giving here so there's my disclaimer right now but even if you had facilities and you were looking at um, you know investing in in other in other either property or equities or whatever a lot of those investments are paying higher rates of return than what the interest rate is currently so I'll reiterate that's not financial advice but if you look at look at these returns they are so low that it's um it has to be considered if you're in a position to do so, or at the very least, if you're not in a position to do so and things are tough, try and access these rates, lock them in. Uh, I believe that John has also got up here fixed rates, which again, you know, 2.34, 2.64, 2.84, very low rates. So um, I'm not the person to speak to about rates and facilities. Um, we're happy to give you general advice on that, but we will always refer you to either your business banker or to someone like John Carrier or your business, your um, finance broker, if you have one. Um, business lending, very similar. We've, um, we spoke about this previously as well. Um, the banks have brought these um, measures in to make life easier for, bit, for business lenders. Um, so they are deferring repayments. Um, they're, temporarily increasing some overdraft facilities, reducing some interest rates, um, and the government are standing side by side with the bank. So keep this in mind, this isn't free money. This has to be repaid, but the banks are making life easier for business, 
business borrowers. So um, chat to us about this. We're seeing more and more of it happening and understanding more of what the banks are doing. Um, and I actually know through dealing with our business banker as well as to, excuse me, how um, these sort of facilities are being made available to business people. So, um, and happy to chat after the session as well if anyone has any questions on these things. Um, you do need to speak to your lenders, okay? Um, the lenders will want to know about JobKeeper. They want to know about cash boost. They want to know things like um, what's your integrated um, client account with the tax office? Are you up to date? Do you have arrears? Do you have payment plans? All those sorts of things. And they will ask other questions. So please keep it in mind. You will need to be prepared. Um, we're happy to work through those things with you as well. Um, these are also some other areas that we're seeing becoming much more popular particularly debtor and trade financing, uh, invoice funding, um, um, you know, equipment loans. Again, they're, they're very low rates at the moment, as is trade finance. If, you tra if you've got um, trading stock, uh, we're seeing facilities getting put in place at, at very good rates and um, the banks are making it easier to get those in place. So, um, Claude, Michael, we have had a few clients that have successfully um, got approvals and uh, and got the money in the bank already, haven't we? Yeah, correct, Kelvin. So um, they the banks do still require they still go through their um, own credit um, checks and and processing of loans. However, we've seen some instances where they've sort of um, have been a bit more forgiving and trying to help out as best as um, as best as they can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claude. And we've got down there as well. Um, professional service firms are, um, are very attractive to the banks because they have uh, a high regard for them in that their, their earnings are um, almost long-term and guaranteed. Um, and John also has named a couple of the other secondary lenders out there that are, you know, they're almost online lenders. And, uh, and I, I hate the term, but sort of low doc means ultimately they don't require as much. Their, um, their processes are a bit more streamlined. However, they don't have branches. They don't have uh, managers that you can go and chat to, those sorts of things. So keep that in mind. But there are other options out there if your bank can't help you. At the very least, talk to us. We'll, we'll do our best to help you out. Um, these are, again, a couple of the, um, the uh, facilities that John had gotten through. Um, you know, Macquarie. Um, uh, talking about what they require. Um, Spotcap is another lender I'm not familiar with, but um, Wiser and Banjo are two that I, I have had dealings with previously. Again, they're their secondary lenders, making life easier, um, offering some significant sums or even small unsecured sums. So um, keep it in mind, you, your options aren't quite as limited as they used to be. However, let's look at that very last line there, um, rates from 7.95%. So almost three times what we were talking about with the, the big banks earlier. Um, as John said, lots of choices, no one simple answer. You might even um, you know, have a bit of a cocktail of facilities, so keep that in mind. Okay, um, so that's about it on lending. Commercial tenancies is a big area for us at the moment. We've been um, called in to advise not only landlords in relation to um, their rental arrangements, but, uh, sorry, um, tenants in relation to their arrangements and leases, particularly where their business have been um, affected by COVID-19, but also landlords who have got tenants who are affected. So um, this is an area where the, the federal government came out with a mandatory code of conduct. Um, and that really required everyone to negotiate in good faith. Um, and they put in place a, a stepped process. However, that must be rolled out through the states because all of the states have their you know, um, uh, retail tenancy acts and those sorts of things that they need to abide by. So it's ruled by the state government. However, they are mirroring the bills that have been put in place have, have mirrored the federal um, policies and procedures. So keep that in mind. There's a lot of stress and strain out there. We can see, we do see both sides and we act for both sides, um, not in the one, um, Dealing, obviously. However, um, you know we do need to to do the right thing by everyone to make sure that these businesses can survive, and also that the landlords can survive. Because uh, it's not as if the landlords are all you know um, rich and wealthy and uh, don't have commitments of their own. So 
Uh, it can't all be on the landlord to, to carry the load. Um, it has to be shared, which is what the government have put in place. They've actually um, recommended that uh, whatever happens and, and they're utilising JobKeeper as well as the benchmark to say if you qualify for, for JobKeeper and, for example, you have a downturn of uh, 40% in your uh, revenue, then that 40% um, decline should be or should allow for a shared reduction in rent. So 20% of that being a, a straight out reduction in rent for the period up to September and the other 20% being a deferral to be added to the remaining tenancy. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. It, um, you know, we, as I said, Claude and I in particular have dealt with a fair bit, but I think Michael's also had some dealings. Um, so talk to us if you're concerned, um, but we're, you know, we're happy to help you out, give you a bit of guidance and um, point you in the right direction. And we actually, um, we have been um, dealing with a couple of law firms around the place who are, who are assisting both tenants and landlords to, to facilitate um, amendments to leases. Because at the end of the day, even though the, the government came out and, and uh, it was almost a Bob Hawke throwaway line saying that, you know, no one, no one can be evicted over the next uh, six months. Bob Hawke was the one that said anyone who, any boss who sacks an employee is a bum. Well, this was ScoMo's moment, I think, where he said no one can be evicted. But at the end of the day, you have a contractual obligation in relation to a lease. So that needs to be abided by. And as such, you do need legal advice if you're varying these sorts of agreements. So. Keep that in mind. We're happy to refer you to law um, lawyers if need be, but at the very least, we can assist you um, generally. Okay. Um, tax planning. Tax tax planning really is Claude's domain. He's the the resident expert on tax planning. So what I am going to very quickly um, um, just allow Claude to give us a quick, you know one to two minutes on tax planning as to what our approach is at the moment. I'm just going to have a quick sip of water while I hand to you, Claude. Thanks, Kelvin. Um, yeah, so tax planning is um, vitally critical this time, or this year, I should say. Most people think because of um, what we've experienced in the last uh, couple of months, six to eight weeks, that there's no need for tax planning as, you know, profits are down, revenues are down and the like. However, we are still seeing businesses that are either maintaining um, revenue as pre-COVID-19, or some industries and some businesses that we've dealt with have actually increased uh, in the last couple of months. So vitally, vitally critical that tax planning um, is performed, not only to, to know where you're at from a, a tax perspective, but also um, what strategies, if any, can be put into place um, to minimize slash reduce your tax obligations. On the flip side, for those clients that have experienced a decline in turnover, um, then yes, there might not be tax planning as such. However, we still recommend doing it only because they would have paid installments for, you know, the first three quarters of the year. So that may well more than cover their tax obligations for year end. So in that case, um, at least you know for the June quarter um, tax instalment, uh, whether you're a company, an individual or the like, um, there's a possibility to vary that down, sometimes we're up to zero. And in some cases, you can even request a refund of what you've previously paid. So therefore, um, critical in getting cash flow into your business. So yeah, again, we still believe tax planning is very critical, um, even more so than previous years. So by all means, if you'd like to, and we're doing, um, uh, starting the process already with our clients, um, but if you haven't heard from us or want to have a chat about it, by all means, reach out and um, get in contact with us. Thanks, Claude, I do appreciate that. And yeah, um, I sort of reiterate what Claude said, that um, it's interesting times, and even where we've got clients that, um, um, that uh, you know, I think they don't have any issue with tax, but, um, they're also receiving JobKeeper. It is a, a sort of zero sum game. If, you, if you've got employees getting paid and you're receiving JobKeeper, that's a sort of neutral situation in your hands with the business. Therefore, if normally you would have employed those people, um, that effectively means your profit is up and your tax could be up um, in a corresponding manner. So 
keep it in mind. Um, if nothing else, as Claude said, we've got some clients that have done really well um, and their business have just been booming over the last three months. So they've got some serious tax issues despite what, what we read in the West and see on the news. Um, other people are saying to us, need to get my tax return, return done early, need to get access to some of those dollars. Need, and similarly, um, need to apply for finance, need to get things in place so that we, um, so that we can move forward. So um, not going to dwell on tax planning. We do talk a fair bit about it. We will send out some information as well in relation to tax planning, which um, gives you a bit of a guide on what we talk about. Um, and we just do talk about business planning as well, rather than just focus on the tax. Where's your business at at the moment? What's important in your business? What do you need to plan for over the next one month, three months, six months, 12 months? So keep that in mind. Um, also, we are running headlong into 30 June. We're about five weeks away from 30 June, which is scary for, for guys like Claude Michael and myself because we've got so much to do between now and 30 June. Uh, there's plenty we have to do. So not only tax planning, which requires a lot of things to be done by um, the 30th and you know no later. Um, we also have things like fringe benefits tax returns, which we're currently doing. Our, our trusted um, expert on FBT, Jethro, is uh, taking care of FBT. If you have an FBT issue, contact ourselves or Jethro um, if he hasn't already been in touch with you. Um, bass lodgements as well. You know, not only have we got bass lodgements by the 28th of July, but uh, as we said a minute ago, we've now got monthly JobKeeper reporting by the by the 14th of the following month. Um, trust resolutions, or as we call them, trust minutes. Again, these must be done by 30 June each year uh, to be effective and to be valid. Otherwise, the ATO will strike a line through them, and that can have some dire consequences when it comes to income tax. Um, we have seen where the ATO have taken a hard line previously and it's not pretty where they just tax the top margin and make you in 10. Um, so again, we'll be out, we'll be in touch with uh, all of our clients over the next one to two weeks, uh, if not the next one to two days in relation to trust minutes. We need to get them agreed and signed off pre-30 June. Uh, asset write-offs. Um, this is one of the other measures that in particular that the federal government came out and put on the table where you could write off assets up to $150,000. Um, that's gained a little bit of momentum in the last couple of weeks. I think uh, we've all had queries and, uh, and um, um, you know, questions about, all right, well, what's, uh, what does it entitle you to? How do we get access to it? What do we need to do? What assets qualify? Um, what should I do? Again, you've got five weeks to take advantage of that. So if you are considering buying assets in the next couple of months, if you do it uh, pre-30 June, you can write off up to $150,000 of an asset. Uh, although if it's a motor vehicle, you need to talk to us because you will not get that higher claim in relation to motor vehicles. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, superannuation as well. It's just a gentle reminder. It, it dovetails in with superannuation with uh, tax planning, uh, but again, if you're looking at contributions to superannuation, whether they be um, concessional or deductible contributions or non-concessional, you need to get them in um, not on 30th of June, not just prior to it, but I would suggest well before. Um, I believe last year the superannuation funds, the the big ones, had cut off dates around about the 20th or early 20s of of June. So don't leave it too late if you're intending putting money into superannuation, which is still a significant, you know, tax planning measure. Um, again, not tax planning and not financial advice on our part. Um, you need to start considering it in the next one to two weeks, really, and planning for it because uh, if you want to put money in, you need the cash flow for it as well. So keep it in mind. Um, business continuity planning. Again, this is something that we're continually doing now with most clients we just run through seven areas in the business uh, which you need to be considering uh, we commenced doing this eight eight weeks ten weeks ago i'd say claude and yeah. worked through very effectively with claude with clients uh, both old and new where we work through all of these matters and just help people to start thinking on a deeper level about their business across these seven areas right from 
you know, what cash you've got in the bank, how you maintain your cash, what about your team, your employees, um, your suppliers, all stakeholders within a business. And at the end of the day, yourself. You need to be thinking about yourself, not selfishly, but you need to preserve yourself. We've been describing it on the basis that you may have employees, you may have customers, you may have suppliers, banks, all these other people around the place um, who you are concerned about. But unless you take good care of yourself, it's a bit like when you fly on a jet and, uh, you know, when the oxygen masks fall, they always say, you know, if you're traveling with children, put your own mask on first so that then you can help your children and other people. This is important in this case. You need to be taking good care of yourself so that you can take good care of other people in your business or around it. Keep it in mind, mental health is a serious issue in our society these days, so we need to be talking about it. But that really deals with all of the stakeholders in your business and your business. Um, and again, how we can help you. We, you know where we are. We are, we are here, you know, literally and, and uh, figuratively in that sense that, um, you know, here business and wealth is here to help you at all times. We may be, and at the moment, I'm sitting at home, Claude's in the office, Michael is actually in his home office, but we're all available to help you remotely uh, via Zoom meeting, via email, via phone call. So please keep in touch with us. Um, now, look, I'm, how am I going for time, guys? We've got about 15 minutes to run through a few questions. Um, and what I will do, I, I think I did see a couple of questions um, submitted via the chat section. So I might need uh, someone like Serena to, to uh, repost those for me if they've gotten down the, the line. And I might need Claude and Michael to just start considering them. So what I will do also, I'll just run through a couple of these and this is where I'm going to call on my trusted colleagues Claude and Michael to answer some of these so I suppose Claude what I might might do is ask you to answer this one what is the impact of the stimulus on financial statements yes um, so with the so there was two forms of stimulus packages announced and a lot of clients have started to receive the first one was the I think they called it the cash boost stimulus payments where it's the credits you received on your um, activity statements being the um, PAYG withholding amounts. Now, in some instances, we've seen clients receive actual refunds because their accounts have gone into credit. So where that's the case, um, they still need to be shown in the financial statements as income. However, it is non accessible income. And there is no GST on that as well. So Create a separate um, income account, call it ATO um, cash flow boost payments, something similar. Um, don't have any GST codes attached to it. Um, it's there in your income statements, but it will be non-accessible and adjusted at year end from a tax, um, tax viewpoint. With JobKeeper, that's a little bit different. Um, that has to be shown as income and that is accessible income in the hands of the business or the entity. Um, again, no GST applies on amounts received, but the full amount of uh, job keeper payments will be assessed for income tax purposes. Okay, thanks, Claude. And um, I, I sort of I uh, defer to Claude and Michael because they're uh, they're doing a lot more of this than I am, particularly right down to setting you know chart of accounts and. Uh, and um, coding transactions and things like that. So hopefully that answers the uh, that question. But uh, again, well, I think there might be a couple of other questions in relation to that as well. Uh, this next one is very similar. What is the accounting treatment of stimulus funds, JobKeeper and cash flow boost, and the treatment in tax returns? Uh, Michael, you might want to deal with this one. I think it's a similar answer to the last, but the tax yeah. return aspect. Well, pretty much exactly what uh, Claude just said. Um, just to repeat, the uh, the JobKeeper is accessible and it is um, treated as income on the tax return. Uh, the cash flow boost itself is non-accessible, non-exempt. So therefore, it's um, taken off the income when it comes to reporting on your tax return, just via an, uh, an adjustment. Obviously, we do that. So uh, we're across it. Thanks, Michael. That is a really important distinction too. JobKeeper is taxable and accessible. Cash flow boost is tax free, guys. So it's uh, it's really good money to uh, to get access to. So you can sort of gross that up for tax uh, effectively. And uh, it, in some cases, where we're seeing clients getting a 
you know, fifty thousand dollar kick, that's a bit like getting a uh, a new seventy thousand dollar client uh, in the door. So yeah, and, although, and yeah. although we say the job keeper is accessible, I mean the the net effect is that it is replacing the wages. So um, the, the net effect on the return is nil, just to make sure everyone is aware. So don't be too alarmed by the fact that job keeper is taxable. Mm. Yes, yeah, spot on, Michael. Um, and just, just further to that, in regards to the treatment in the tax return, um, we haven't seen the 2020 returns being released yet uh, by the various, um, firstly by the ATO and also by um, the software vendors that everyone uses. But I dare say there might be a label in the tax return that will stip, um, stipulate JobKeeper income or JobKeeper payments. And I'm guessing that's a way for the ATO to cross-check that people have recorded their JobKeeper payments in their tax return and data match it with payments they've actually received from the ATO. Yeah. And, and worth keeping in mind, guys, that you know the ATO do data match all of this information. So even when people are applying for JobKeeper already, uh, we have um, been told by a few clients that who, who have applied for JobKeeper themselves, they've been rejected or they've been queried because the ATO already know who you employ, how much you pay them, when you pay them, how long you've been paying them. So very important, the ATO almost know more about you than, than you know yourself. And in our case, you know, sometimes where clients are doing this themselves, they come to us saying, why has this happened? And the ATO are sort of a step ahead of everyone because that reporting's going on day by day. So keep that in mind, um, just a bit of a heads up. We're well aware of it because the ATO continue to ram it down our throat, so. Um, the next question, sorry, thank you guys. Um, what do I need to do to get the benefits of the instant asset write-off? I'm happy to answer that, as I said earlier. Um, this is a very good question because uh, um, uh, some people think that you need to submit, you need to apply. You don't need to do any of those things. Effectively, the instant asset write-off is an um, accelerated depreciation claim. Um, so therefore, it's no different to how you would normally deal with any capital asset that you buy in your business. Um, you let us know about it and quite often you, we'll, we'll question you, we'll ask you for the original invoice. So, um, but the purpose of that is to so that we can see what type of asset it is, um, how we write it off, as in depreciate it um, over the life of the, the asset. But in the case of the instant asset write-off, that just effectively means we'll still ask for that detail when we do your um, accounts at the end of the year, when we lodge your tax return. But instead of writing it off, for example, over five years, over eight years, we'll write it off over one year, meaning 100% depreciation in this first year. So that's effectively how you get the benefit. Um, the benefit will flow through um, reduced, like um, increased deduction, reduced profit, therefore um, a reduced tax liability at the end of the financial year. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question there. Um, what is the format and content required for the monthly, oh, sorry, my panel is uh, monthly reporting for JobKeeper. Uh, Michael, you might want to answer that one. You've done plenty. So. Yeah, uh, so uh, the format's quite simple um, and the content is purely um, the information about your eligible uh, employees. Um, now that's dependent on how many employees you have um, and whether you're registered for SDP or not. Um, so. Uh, something uh, worth talking to us about if you're feeling it in yourself. Um, and then also uh, additional to that is um, your current monthly turnover and then your projected turnover for the next month. Now, mm. the projected turnover is just, as you alluded to previously, is just simply a, a means for the ATO to track how your business is going under JobKeeper. So, um, again, you said that there's no retesting, and, and that, that is true, but it's just merely a, a sort of tracking tool the ATO have implemented. Thanks, Michael. Do appreciate that. Uh, for those of you who have gone through the process already, you'll, you'll be familiar with it. It's not um, too much of a burden. Um, probably the, the hardest part for any of us has been, you know, getting forecasts out of clients and... Uh, and putting that figure in because everyone's just a little bit concerned about you know what the requirement is and how we forecast and how it's going to be compared but our advice or or the direction we've got from the ATO is don't be overly concerned do your best to get it right but don't be overly concerned okay 
Um, the next question we have, can you provide an end of year checklist? Look, I'm, apologies, I'm not sure who uh, asked this question. And also I'm not really sure what it was in relation to, whether it was in relation to completion of financial statements, whether it was in relation to um, uh, JobKeeper or cash flow boost or some other purpose. But look, we, um, we will quite often um, provide uh, end of year checklists for our clients in relation to accounting or tax. Um, however, with the clients that we're, we're currently working with, we usually uh, uh, know what sort of uh, issues may come up. So we may tailor it slightly, but, um, but look, if you wanted to email us separately and let us know, you know, what it is that you are chasing and if it is year end, we can perhaps assist you in that regard. So um, checklist, we could give you so many checklists that you'll, you won't sleep at night or, or it will put you to sleep. So um, we just need to, to hone in on what it is that you need a checklist for. Um, sorry, the next question, details about the employer cash boost payment delay. Um, look, if you have had a delay in this, there's various reasons and, and I'll seek Claude and, uh, and uh, Michael's help on this one. But uh, one of the areas that we saw there were delays are if you're expecting a refund, um, it could be that the ATO doesn't have uh, bank account details for you to pay that refund and they no longer pay by check um, or it might be a wrong bank account. Um, so keep that in mind. That's one area that you may, um, you may be able to clean up, clear up very quickly. Um, you can chat to us if it's at our end and we're doing the work for you. Um, or it might be something that, you know, perhaps you weren't entitled to the cash flow boost. So um, without knowing the, the precise details of, of what the delay is about, um, that could be it. There's also a situation where we've seen if you've got a current debt with the ATO, um, there was talk from the ATO that they would offset the cash flow boost against that debt. That hasn't happened in all cases, but it could be that there was a debt there and for some reason the ATO have have snaffled it and um, the, the, at least that means that it's reduced your obligation to them. So keep that in mind as well. Um, okay, the next question, is JobKeeper likely to continue to the end of September in its current format? Look, there has been a bit of speculation, um, my view or my understanding on it and, and my personal opinion as well. Um, there was a throwaway line, I think at a press conference about two weeks ago, where there was comment that, um, the uptake of this was more significant than expected. As a result, they were concerned about the finances. And that's probably where the pushback came from saying, oh, maybe we can't afford it, we'll have to wind it back. Um, my take on that is that they won't, uh, this won't be wound back. They put it in place to support business. Uh, I, I take it that they're going to stand by that and September will come around quite quickly. And at the end of the day, it, this is government money being put back into the economy. It's not being put into savings, I don't believe. It's maintaining employment. We've already seen the employment figures shoot through the roof uh, last month. And it's quite scary. So the ATO would not want this wound back so that all of these people end up back at Centrelink. Uh, they want people to be maintained as employees. They want them to be paid. And they... Um, it seems they're happy to, to make these payments to business. So it's our hope, um, but I believe it's the government's intention to maintain this through to September and, you know, put some money in the economy so that we can kickstart it, which we do need. We all know that. So that's my view. Again, happy to, to have the discussion if you'd like to uh, continue it at any time. Um, um, look, that was the last question. Uh, lodged prior to this session. However, we had have had a couple of questions. So if you'll just bear with me for a moment, and I'm actually going to work backwards, so this is not favoritism, but we have still got a few minutes. Uh, so if everyone is happy to stay on the line, we have a question that says, our company recently purchased a new vehicle outright for $50,000. That is no finance. And you mentioned this was dealt with slightly differently to other assets in relation to write-offs, how so? Um, look, a very good question. Um, motor vehicles, for those of you that have ever bought a vehicle uh, in excess of $50,000, so in this case, Peter, you're, you're in the clear, but motor vehicles have only ever been capable of being depreciated up to a certain level. And that level has hovered around about the $55,000, $60,000 mark. So if you bought a vehicle that was 
less than or equal to that limit, you were entitled to claim all of the depreciation on that vehicle over the life of that car. However, if you went out and bought a car in excess of that, for example, you spent $100,000 on a car, you couldn't claim the excess. So you can only depreciate it up to, Michael, what's the current figure? Is it fifty seven, fifty eight thousand dollars $58,000? I think it's fifty seven four one one. Okay, so let's call it $57,000. 57. So in this case, to confirm, um, you know, to answer your question, if you've bought a car worth $50,000, that will qualify for the instant asset write-off. Um, if you bought it, a car worth up to $57,400, you would be entitled to it. However, if you go over, and I know Toyota are guilty, and I think Honda are similar, guilty of advertising saying, hey, come and buy a new car and you can claim all of it. Well, that's not 100% right. So if you went and bought a brand new um, 200 series Land Cruiser for $120,000, you cannot claim a deduction for that amount. You can claim 57,000, but you can't claim the full 120 ever. Okay, um, Michael and Claude, you can give me the nod of the head to tell me I've got that right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, spot on, and I'll uh, correct myself. Fifty-seven five eight one. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah so that, um, but further to that, Kelvin also is you can only claim GST up to the the cost limit as well. So in your case of the Land yes. Cruiser, yes, correct. Um, you can only claim GST on the fifty-seven thousand um, dollars, and nothing else above that. Okay. So there's a couple Thank of components. Uh, but further to the, that question by um, Peter. Um, in your case, Peter, it looks like you will be able to claim the full amount as a deduction, 100%. However, depending on the type of vehicle you've purchased, there could be some fringe benefits implications. Um, mm. So, but that's something that gets dealt with down the track. So, um, so yeah. So there could just be some some FBT again if it's a, a passenger vehicle or a a work unit. There's different scenarios on how it gets dealt with. But again, happy to chat more about it with myself or one of the team to um to clarify a couple of those things thanks Claude. motor vehicles can be a bit of a headache and a minefield so and there's another question from someone i'm not sure who this is but um 57581 write off excluding gst that is correct it is excluding gst isn't it guys yes um and the balance cannot be depreciated over time question mark spot on that it, the balance cannot be depreciated over time so so in this case, if you went and bought a, a motor vehicle today and it cost you 57,581 plus GST, um, instant write off straight out the door. If you, you qualify, you can claim the GST on that amount as well of $5,758. However, you go over that, you can't claim any more. Okay, so um, it used to be that you could buy a pretty well tricked up dual cab Hilux for uh, within that figure, but I think they're even over the limit now, well and truly. So, um, uh, and yeah, Peter Jethro's probably already on to you, so good to hear that he's on the job. Um, so yes, hopefully to the unidentified user who asked that question, um, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it excludes GST, and no, the balance cannot be depreciated over time. Now, I have a couple of questions here that I think got posted earlier. That's why I asked Serena to post them, repost them. So thanks, Serena. Um, one of the questions is um, in relation to JobKeeper, a company whose shareholder is a trust, can the beneficiary of the shareholder trust apply as a business participant? Um, Claude, Michael, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, look, um, it's a bit of a conjecture with this one. Um, they do say to be an eligible business participant, it needs to be a natural person who is actively working in the business and not receiving income elsewhere. So I suppose um, one way to answer this is we've got a client who operates a business as a partnership of two trusts. Um, they are not eligible because the, the partners are not a natural person, they are a trust. So in this case, I would say the similar scenario would apply. However, in most cases with companies, um, the person who would be a beneficiary of the trust more than likely would be a director of the company. So you can be an in a company situation, you can be an eligible business participant either as a shareholder or and or as a director. So while this scenario it appears you wouldn't qualify being a shareholder, if that same person is the director of the company, then yes, they would qualify as an eligible business participant. Yeah, good answer. 
Um, we've only a few quirks with JobKeeper in relation to eligible business participant as well. Um, right down to, you know, uh, if you're an undischarged bankrupt but operating a business as a sole trader, employing people, you're not entitled to it yourself. So um, there's some, some strange little intricacies with it. However, it is worth investigating for all it's worth. It's worth $3,000 a month you know, almost $20,000 over six months. So it's well and truly worth going hard on getting your eligibility. And keep in mind as well, if that company, uh, whether you're employing for, applying for you as a director or, you know, someone else within the business as a director, um, it doesn't really matter who it is. It's about the company getting or having an eligible business participant and therefore the company getting paid that money because the money doesn't have to be paid out. Okay, so again, Michael, that's correct, isn't it? So, Sorry, say that again, Kelvin. In the sense that as an eligible business participant with a company, um, the money is payable to the company in relation to that EBP, um, but it doesn't have to be paid out as a wage to anyone in particular. So it doesn't that's have to be correct. paid as a dividend, doesn't have to be paid yeah. as a director's fee. So that's correct. keep that in mind. Um, there is a, another question from the same person. Can a director of a company who was appointed after the 1st of March 2020 applies a business participant of the company for JobKeeper. Mm -hmm. um, look, again, I, I honestly, I haven't seen one of these at, the, at this point in time. Um, as an eligible business participant, from my knowledge, and I know because I had to sign one of these, um, or sorry, complete one of these um, for someone else that, um, but I can't recall whether there was a date in there. It just referred to who the eligible business participant is. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's correct, that's Calvin. Correct. However, the magic date, yeah, when you do the application, it doesn't stipulate the date. Yeah. But okay, the magic good. date is 1 March. Yeah, so, so, and, and keeping in mind that if, for example, if I was appointed after the 1st of March, um, prior to that, then or after that point, prior to me being appointed, there must have been another director as well. So at some point in time, there was a director at the 1st of March. Um, again, it doesn't matter really who the person is as long as there is someone. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm, I'm not really sure who, who this is. So you actually identified just as user. So you've kept yourself anonymous, but feel free to drop us a line after this if you like. And, and even, you know, one or all of us can have a chat to you separately. So. Um, but thanks for the question. They're really good questions. So we are loading all of these questions on our website as well. Um, thanks to Serena. So we're, we're building up quite a good portfolio. So I do recommend that you jump to, to our website. If you have any questions, you jump to YouTube. If you want to have a look at previous webinars um, and you come back with any questions, Claude and my email addresses were posted uh, earlier. Um, Michael's also happy to take your calls or your emails. So, um, look, we don't seem to have any other questions, but um, I'm happy to take any other questions that you may have now or, or at a later date. But um, what I will do is just try and wrap up if everyone's happy to. Claude and Michael, you haven't got anything else that you would like to add? Not all good. Thanks, okay. Claude. No, no, Thank, you. Thank you very much. And hopefully Serena's not going to yell at me for not uh, raising anything. But look, I do appreciate everyone's time on a Friday, particularly when the sun's shining and we're about to get some nasty weather over the weekend. So um, it'd be nice if everyone could jump out and, uh, and enjoy some of the nice weather that we've currently got. Um, but apart from that, look, I do wish you all well. I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, and I encourage you to, to um, you know, stay in touch with us. Let us know how you're going. Let us know how you're finding the webinars. We, we are going to, um, you know, do our best to continue these sorts of webinars as long as they're of benefit to our clients, um, particularly during the uncertain times that we're in. However, I, you know, I'm personally of the view that we're starting to see um, the other side of it, albeit slowly. Um, we're starting to see some lessening of restrictions and some positivity coming out as well. Um, so I, I think even though if you read the West Australian, it is all doom and gloom, um, they like to sell bad news but I, we are seeing some good news stories out there as well. So I encourage you all to, to try and respond positively to what's going on out there where you can, um, you know, to do your best as you always do. Um, and to, um, you know, take the appropriate steps in relation to your business and yourself personally, look after yourselves as always. Um, 
and um, we look forward to seeing you all very soon, um, whether it be pre or post 30 June. Well, um, um, whenever it is, we um, look forward to catching up with all of you. So thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate your time. And I will uh, end the session now so that uh, you can all get on with your day. Thank you, Michael, Claude, Serena, and everyone else on the call. Thanks. Yeah, everybody. Uh, for those of you who showed your face and asked questions and uh, participated. So thank you very much. Um, look forward to talking to you all again soon. Um, enjoy your Friday.